And the world has to know that Jesus is coming. And the world has to know that not only is he coming, how we can be ready, how we can prepare. And I think that that book, Great Controversy, it really gets right into the heart of the issues that we'll be facing these last days. So I would encourage those of you who can, let us go out and give these books out and share this wonderful, glorious message to our community. As you can see on our screen, you see the sanctuary. And as we read in our scripture reading, we read in the book of Daniel chapter 8, verses 9 through 14, we read about a work that will take place in this world before Jesus comes. That's a prophetic message. The sanctuary truth, the sanctuary message will be restored. A work of restoration has begun, and you and I have to be part of this work. The sanctuary truth and the message has been buried for thousands of years. It has been corrupted. It has been distorted. A counterfeit system has been put in the place of what God wants to do in the lives of his people and in the lives of men and women across the world. The counterfeit is being exalted and the truth has been obscured, but it won't be obscured forever because God has a people and they will take a message to the world. And you know, the book Great Controversy, it explains everything we're going to be studying. In fact, it does it in much greater detail. So I would encourage you to actually study this subject from the chapters on the sanctuary of the Great Controversy. But yes, we read in Daniel chapter 8 that it was a little horn that caused the truth to be destroyed. Now, who's the little horn of Bible prophecy? You know who the little horn is. Yes, ever since the rise of the papal power, faith has been turned from God, from Jesus, to sinful, erring, mortal men. And instead of looking to him for the forgiveness of our sins, a counterfeit system has substituted the glorious truth that God has. And did you know that within the sanctuary, that's where the original copy of God's law is that was written by his own finger? Did you know that? We know that if you study the sanctuary. And so that's what's been under attack. And let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, let me tell you something you may already know, or maybe you don't know. Only Seventh-day Adventists understand this great and glorious truth. Only Adventists understand this. There are other churches that will tell you about the Sabbath. Yes, there are. We're not the only ones. Did you know we're not the only ones who understand the Sabbath? We're not the only ones who understand about the health message. Other churches can tell you about health. Other churches will tell you that Jesus is coming. Other churches may tell you that, you know what? The dead do not go on living after they die. Other churches will tell you about those things. But listen, only Adventists, only Seventh-day Adventists will tell you and help you to understand about the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. 1844, the Day of Atonement, the investigated judgment. That, only Adventists have an understanding of this glorious truth. And why is that, my brothers and sisters? Why is that? Because there is a diabolical attack against this truth. There is. It exists. There's an attempt to destroy this concept. Because if you destroy the, the heavenly sanctuary, 1844, the Day of Atonement, the investigative judgment, if you can erase and eliminate those truths, then you eliminate the concept that God's law is important and the foundation of his kingdom. You destroy the concept that that sanctification is important and necessary. What does the word sanctuary mean? Ask yourself that question. What does the word sanctuary mean? It comes from a word means sanctification. In fact, the original Hebrew word for the sanctuary was the holy place. 
the holy place. The holy is what it was called. And it, depending on the context, you had the, the holy of the holies and then the holy place. And so when you destroy this concept, if you can take this out of the minds and hearts of people, you destroy the concept th- that God is in the process of establishing a holy royal nation of priesthood of peculiar people you destroy that glorious truth and listen my brothers and sisters I want to just tell you when when God took the nation of Israel out of Egypt he did not send them directly into the land of Canaan because they were not ready to enter before he took them into the promised land He took them to Mount Sinai. He gave them two things. He gave them the law and he gave them the sanctuary services. And that was necessary. That was essential. To give them an experience so that they can become the men and women. They can become the nation that God ordained for them to be from the very beginning. It would have restored them by embracing the truth it would have restored that perfect relationship they had in the Garden of Eden. And then they would have entered the promised land and they would have had an eternal rest had they embraced those glorious truths. Let me tell you today, God has given us the message of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. And that message is going to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. That message is going to prepare you to stand before him when he comes in all the glory of the angels, all the glory of the Father. And it will prepare us to live in the presence of a holy God. You know, the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. Are you getting ready to meet him? There's a work of preparation. Now, what we're going to do I'm going to show you the strong biblical basis. What did I say? The strong biblical basis. Because, you know, a lot of those theologians and scholars and those who who are antagonistic against this message, they'll tell you, you can't prove it in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. Yeah, you can, you can read about it in Great Controversy. You can read it from the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy. Yeah, you can prove it from Ellen White, but you can't prove this glorious message from the Bible. What are they talking about? They don't, have, they don't have a clue that our pioneers, yes, they didn't have the PhDs. They didn't have degrees. But listen, they knew exactly what the Bible said. And I want to show you the strong biblical basis and evidence. Look at the book of Revelation chapter 1. Follow with me. Revelation chapter 1, it says, And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Let me ask you, did John recognize that voice that spoke to him? Did he recognize that voice? You better believe it. That was the voice of his best friend. And he said, that's the voice of Jesus. Where is Jesus? Where is he? And it goes on to say, and being turned, I saw. What did he see? Seven golden candlesticks. He didn't see Jesus right away. But he saw seven golden candlesticks. What does that mean, my brothers and sisters? That seven golden candlesticks is an article. It's furniture. It's furniture that was specifically created to serve a purpose in the sanctuary. And when John looked to see Jesus, he saw seven golden candlesticks. It says, And one like the Son of Man clothed with a garment. What kind of a garment, my brothers and sisters? What kind of a garment? Not just any garment. It's the garment that the priest would use to officiate in the sanctuary. And let me tell you, was was John looking at Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem? No, he was not looking at the temple in Jerusalem. What happened to the temple of Jerusalem when this vision took place? This took place in after 90 AD. 
What happened in 70 AD? The temple was destroyed. And all the articles of furniture, they were taken out of Jerusalem. So no, this is not talking about Jerusalem. So he sees seven golden candlesticks. He sees one like the Son of Man with the garment clothes down to the foot and girt about the paps with the golden girdle. My brothers, that's the, high, that's the vestments that the priest would use. What does it mean? Notice what this says. Revelation chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. And I saw seven angels which stood before who? Is that on earth? No, it's not on earth. This is in heaven. I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints. Listen, upon the golden altar which was before the throne. My brothers and sisters, what is that talking about? You know exactly what that golden altar is. That is another article of furniture that was in the sanctuary. But we're not talking about the earth. That was destroyed. We're talking about heaven, the presence of God, the throne of God. There's a golden altar before the throne of God. And there's incense. And every time we pray, our prayers are mingled with that incense and they're offered before the golden altar of God. Praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord. This all means something. What does it mean, Andy? What does it mean? Notice, Revelation eleven nineteen. 19, it says... And the temple of God was opened where? In heaven, my brothers and sisters. How, how could we miss this? How, how could the, is that clear enough? Or is there some kind of codified process of hermeneutic interpretation and we have to give some kind of allegoric application? No, my brothers. This is too clear to, to mix anything up. There's a sanctuary. There's a temple. God has a temple and it's in heaven. And it was open. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. What's up there, my brothers? The ark. Is that Noah's ark? No, it's not Noah's ark. Don't look for the giraffes and animals. No, we're not talking about Noah's ark. It's the golden box with the cherubim. What's inside the golden box? Somebody, anybody. What's inside? The law of God. You know the law of God is there. And let me tell you, that's why the law of God can never be changed. Because the original copy is up there. And let me tell you, I don't care, no pope, no pastor, no priest, no elders can go into heaven and change what God has up there. And you know, my brothers and sisters, we're going to see there's a work of judgment that's taking place. And within the most holy place, the law of God is there. And there's a day when we will be called to account to give an answer for all that we have done in the flesh. And there's a standard by which that judgment is going to take place. It's in there. It's in there. That's why there's a diabolical attack against this glorious truth. Because no one wants to be held account for anything. What does this all mean? Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. Now listen, I've never been to heaven, and I don't know what they have there, but I don't have to go to heaven. You know why? Because we have been given a model, a copy of the original. Notice what it says. Hebrews 8, 1 through 5. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, notice, and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Listen, there's a true sanctuary. There is what is called an original sanctuary which God himself made, and man had nothing to do with that. 
Did you know that? Well, now you do. There's an original. And notice, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see, says he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. Listen, when Moses was about to create the earthly sanctuary, God says, look, do it just like mine. Follow it in every detail. Make it look just like the original. We have a model. It's not the original. But we're given an illustration so that you can understand what takes place in heaven. What is God doing for us? Well, he's watching over us. He's doing a lot more than watching us. What is, what is Jesus doing for us right now? Well, he answers our prayer. Yes, he does. But he's doing a lot more. And if you want to understand what is taking place in heaven, you have to look at the picture, at the model that has been given to us. Now, what does the model show? For lack of time, what does the model teach? We're told in Leviticus chapter 4, it says, If any of the common people sin through ignorance, while he does somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord. We're told right there in the very beginning, you know, Leviticus is part of what we understand as the Torah. The first five books written by Moses those were the first books penned and given to man. And we're told right at the very beginning what sin is. We ought not to be confused. People say, well, we got to turn to 1 John chapter 3, one of the last books in the Bible that says, He who sins transgresses the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. We're told that in 1 John, one of the last books ever written. But here we're told at the very beginning what sin is. It's when you disobey and you break God's commandments. So what happens if I sin? Or if his sin, which he has sinned, come to his knowledge, he shall bring an offering, a kid of the goats, a female without blemish, for his sin, which he has sinned. He shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering in place of the burnt offering. Listen, they knew how serious sin was. It's we today, we don't know. We don't understand. We don't understand because you don't have to take a lamb and you don't have to cut its throat. You don't have to watch it die. You don't have to look in the face and say, I'm sorry, I know you didn't do anything. It was me. But because of my sin, you're going to pay. You're going to die. They knew how serious sin was. And uh, so, okay, I bring, a, I bring my lamb. The lamb is killed. I'm free. I'm saved. I've been justified. It's all over. It's all been done. No, my brothers, no. You're just beginning. It's not over. And you know, unfortunately, the evangelical world... They have this idea that, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, there's a lamb. When he died on the cross, that's it. It's over. Nothing else to be done. I don't need anything more. It was all completed at the cross. My brother, that's blasphemy. It was not all completed at the cross. And let me show you from the Bible that it's not enough for you to have a lamb. It's not enough to have a sacrifice. You have to have a priest to actually take the blood of the sacrifice into the presence of God and plead your case and ask for forgiveness and make atonement for you. And when the priest made that atonement, then forgiveness came. You know what that means? It wasn't all completed at the cross in AD 31. Let me read it to you. Leviticus chapter 4, next verse, verse 30. And the priest shall take the blood thereof with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar and shall pour it out the blood thereof. Notice, and he shall take away the fat thereof. It goes on to say, and the priest shall burn it upon the altar and the priest shall make an atonement for him. What happens after the priest 
applies the blood in my case and pleads with the Father, what happens after the priest does his job? And it shall be forgiven him. When does forgiveness come? After the priest. See, I'm the guilty person. I can't go into the presence of God and say, God, you know what? I'm sorry I killed your son. Can you imagine that? You don't go knocking on your neighbor's house and say, neighbor, I'm sorry, but I'm the one who killed your son. You don't do that. You know who's going to do that? The victim. And can you imagine if the victim comes back to life from, from this terrible death and the victim goes and tells his father, do you love me? What's the father going to say? Yes. Well, if you love me, forgive this person. Will your neighbor forgive you? If the victim comes and pleads your case, would, he, would, would the neighbor forgive you? Yes. And when Jesus, after he rose from the dead, he stands before his father and he pleads your case for us. My brother, that's when forgiveness comes. Yes, you, it's not enough to have a priest, you must have a sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness for sins. But guess what? Without the mediation of a priest, who's going to plead your case? All right, let's, so, okay, so I've gone through verse 30. The priest, he pled my case. My sin is forgiven. The Bible says, it shall be forgiven him. That's it. It's over. It's all done, right? No. It's not over yet. You say, Andy, but... My brothers, listen, I'll give you an example. For example, if I tell you, if I say to you, I want you to go to the airport. I have a friend. Go pick up my friend. My brother, can you go pick up my friend at the airport, please? All right, thank you. Who is he? What does he look like? But if I give you a picture of my friend, right? If I give you the picture, go pick up this person at the airport, you're going to know exactly who it is. And when you look at the model, you know exactly what's taking place in heaven. You don't have to guess. And listen, you can go through what is called the daily service every day of the year. And it was necessary because we're fulfilling what God says. However, if you didn't participate on what was called the day of atonement, it didn't work out very well for you. Let me read that to you. Leviticus chapter 23. And on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be in a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Notice, ye shall do no work on that day. For whosoever soul it be not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. Let me ask you a question. Was this important? You better believe it. Could I say, well, you know what? Every, I've done it every day. I went to the daily service. You know what? I think on the day of atonement, I think I'm going to go on a family picnic. You think we could do that? I think I'm going to take the kids. We're going to go swimming today. I think I'm going to cut my lawn today on the day of atonement. No, my brothers. It didn't matter if you went every day to the temple and received forgiveness of sins. If you did not afflict your soul on the day of atonement which was a day of judgment you were cut off from the people what does that mean it means that something happened to the sanctuary during the daily services every day as people come and they confess their sin and the sins were transferred something happened to the sanctuary Sin, my brothers, listen. Sin corrupts. Sin contaminates. Sin will pollute. You think it's not going to affect me. My brothers, it will affect you and all the people around you. Sin has a contaminating influence. And when sin was brought into the sanctuary, guess what happened to the sanctuary? It became defiled. It became corrupted. It became polluted. And in order for the plan of salvation to be complete, not just were the people supposed to be 
cleansed and purified from their sins and washed the sanctuary and the record of all the sins, the sanctuary itself had to be cleansed. Let me show you from the Bible. People say, what are you talking about that the sanctuary has to be cleansed? And people say, what are you talking about that the heavenly sanctuary has to be cleansed? There's, there's nothing unclean in heaven. All of heaven is holy. There's no holy and most holy. There's no cleansing that has... My brother, where did sin originate? Where did sin originate? Yes, it originated in heaven. The Bible says there was war in heaven. Sin originated in heaven. And I'm going to show you how the earthly sanctuary, a model of the, of the original, I want you to notice what they had to do on the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16, verse 16, and he shall make an atonement for who? The holy place. That's the sanctuary. An atonement, a cleansing took place. Notice, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Let me tell you, my brothers, listen. If sin contaminated the holy place of God, don't imagine that you can play with sin and nothing's going to happen to you. Just take that out of your mind. If it corrupted the holy place and the most holy place where the presence of God was, it'll destroy your home. You can't play with sin or Satan. It goes on to say, verse 19, and he, that's the high priest, and he shall sprinkle the blood upon it, that's the sanctuary, with his fingers seven times. Man, some of us need seven times cleansing. Some of us need that. Seven times, notice, and cleanse it. Is, does it say cleanse it? Was it cleaned? Yes. Was it corrupted and polluted? Yes. Do you clean something that doesn't need to be cleaned, wives? I better be careful. I, I better be very careful. Because we have some husbands, I, I'm not, not going to pick on the wives. We have husbands that they don't even clean things that need to be cleansed, okay? But wives, do you clean something that's already cleaned? No. And it was cleansed because it needed to be cleansed. And when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. All the sins were placed on that goat. And that goat, we're not talking about the lamb. We're talking about the goat. One was selected, one was sacrificed, and the other was taken out of the camp to die. Okay, that's the earthly sanctuary. we got to close. We're running out of time. That's the earthly. Andy, for sure, you're not saying that the heaven, heaven itself has to be cleansed. I'm not saying it, my brothers. We're told this in the book of Hebrews, that the heavenly sanctuary has to be cleansed. 1844, a work of purification, a work of sanctification, my brothers, is taking place right now in the most holy place. That's what the Bible says. And unfortunately, we have a lot of pastors and theologians that say, you can't prove it in the Bible. It's right here. Hebrews chapter 9. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry. When, when did they sprinkle blood on the tabernacle and on the vessels to cleanse it? When did they do that? On the Day of Atonement. He's comparing the Old Testament services with the heavenly ministration of Christ. He sprinkled the tabernacle. Verse 22, and almost all things are by the law purged, that's cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of the blood, there's no remission, there's no forgiveness. He cleansed the sanctuary with the blood of animal sacrifices. Notice, please follow with me in verse 23. Listen, this is what we call, listen, we're swimming in deep water right now. I mean, you can't, we're not in the, in the pool, we're in the middle of the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, 5,000 feet deep. This is deep theological waters. 
Because the, those who, who are hostile to the Adventist faith, they say that Adventists made up the cleansing of the sanctuary message. We invented that. It's not in the Bible. Listen to this, verse 23. It was necessary that the pattern of the things of heaven. What's the pattern? Which sanctuary is the pattern of the heaven? Which is the pattern of heaven? Earthly. Praise the Lord. You can figure out what a lot of pastors can't figure out. The earthly sanctuary was purified. It was necessary that the pattern of the things of heaven, that's the earthly sanctuary, should be purified with these. What's the these? That's the animal sacrifice. The blood of bulls and goats. It was necessary that the earthly sanctuary be purified with blood. Notice. But the heavenly things themselves. What sanctuary is that? What? It, heaven. The heavenly sanctuary. What about the heavenly sanctuary? What about it? But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices in these. Which sacrifice do you think that is? Come on. That's the blood of Christ. The sacrifice of Jesus. The heavenly, verse 23 says that the heavenly sanctuary will be cleansed with the blood of Jesus. For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, not the copy, which are figures of the true, that's the heavenly, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as a high priest entered in to the holy place every year with the blood of others. You can't miss what's being said. Jesus is not going to be like the high priest here on this earth where year after year after year after year he entered into the most holy place. It's not going to be going on forever and ever and ever and ever, my brothers and sisters. Sin is going to have to come to an end. Pain and suffering and misery will cease to exist soon. For then he must have suffered since the foundation of the world. Notice, listen. Verse 26. But now, how many times? Once. In AD 31. Does it say AD 31? One time, what is he going to do? At what part of earth's history is he going to do this? But now once in the end of the world. That's not AD 31, my brothers and sisters. Paul is saying that Jesus is going to do something at the end of the world. You want to know when that time is? You have to read Daniel 8.14. Unto 2,300 days shall the sanctuary be cleansed. This is a verse that supports Daniel 8.14. Once at the end of the world. What's, what's Jesus going to do at the end of the world? It says, Has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself? You believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is going to give someone an experience? You believe God is going to bring us Recreate us, form us, pure, cleanse. You believe that? And we had better be working in harmony. And we had better be asking and pleading for Christ to grant us this glorious experience. Notice, verse 27, As it is appointed men's, unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. He links the judgment with the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary and a work of purification. You, you ever heard of the investigated judgment? There it is. It's the Day of Atonement, cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, a day of judgment. And notice verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, but unto them that look for him shall he appear. What does that next word say? The second time. That's the great advent of Jesus. That's the second coming. And he's not going to come as a lamb to pay for my sins or to cleanse me of my sins. He's coming.
the second time without sin. What does that mean? No priest, no lamb, none of that. That's all been done. The cleansing, the purification, that work has been completed. And when he comes a second time, he's not coming with any type of relationship with sin, but unto salvation. My brothers and sisters, this is a message that God has given to us as as a remnant church of Bible prophecy. And this is how Israel was to be prepared to enter in the land of Canaan. But they could not enter in because they would not believe. Brothers and sisters, are we getting ready for Jesus to come? Here it is right here. He's coming the second time, not the third time. That's, that, this destroys the rapture theory because the rapture says he's coming, he came once, he's going to come secretly, and then he's coming the third time. No, it's not coming the third time. He's only coming the second time, my brothers and sisters. The final time. And he's coming for those who are ready. Right here, these are the people who are ready. These are the men and women who, by God's grace, are working in harmony with the plan and purpose of heaven. My brothers, may God help us. May God help us to have a, a deeper appreciation of what Jesus is doing bef- for us right now. He's pleading our case. He's confessing our name before his Father. He's asking for a, an experience. And he's granting to men and women help, power. We didn't read everything, but Hebrew... Chapter 4 tells us that we have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted just as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly before his throne of grace that we may obtain what? Help. Help. He's there working right now, offering the help that we need. Not just in our personal lives, but in our relationships. He wants to grant us an experience, my brothers, that's greater. Greater than we, that we allow or give for ourselves. We limit, we limit what God wants to do. We limit the holy hand of Israel in what he wants to do in our lives, in our homes, in our churches. Brothers, he wants to prepare us so that we can receive the latter rain, give this message with power, and then it will all come to an end. Jesus will come in glory. May God help us and give us an urgency to seek this work of preparation. Let us bow our heads. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. We thank you for your truth, Lord. Lord, I, I, I realize that this is an extensive subject. But Father, you have revealed these things, not to to the great men and the learned men, but Lord, to babes, to to humble people. Help us, Lord, to believe in your word and help us to work in harmony to see this accomplished in our lives. We thank you and we ask all these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.